Good evening and welcome again to the video blog of the Monastery of All Saints of North America. This evening we'll continue where we were left off. Any of Matins, the Dawn Watch, what would have been called cock crow because that would be the time when the roosters would have started crowing to waken people. And uh, that between the midnight hour and Matins, that three in the morning the midnight hour would end with the third hour, beginning with the fourth at 4 a.m and uh, carry into the day. You often think of the bird-bearing women making their trek to the tomb in the dawn watch. The sun hadn't completely risen, but it was over the horizon. It was still a bit dark. Still dangerous for them to be out and carrying something of value which might have attracted thieves. The uh, Scent weight of various uh, spices and herbs that they were carrying, myrrh and others, aloes, to complete the anointing of the body of Christ because it was taken down from the tree late on the preparation day. And there wouldn't have been the possibility of taking care of it, it would have had to be in the tomb before the Sabbath, before the dawn of dawn of the soil, really before the eve, eve of the Sabbath. And they would have come now to finish looked what uh, had be, been a, a hasty embalming process. Vespers, Compline, the Midnight Hour, the Dawn Watch, Matins. O God, my God, arise unto the early at dawn. My soul has thirsted for thee. So in the sanctuary I have come before thee to see thy power and thy glory. At Vespers we anticipated with holy expectation the fulfillment of the prophecies and the coming of our redemption. We heard it foretold in psalms and proclaimed in the verses of the Lord I have cried in the Apostica. Through the night our souls kept vigil, filling our lamps of faith with the oil of prayer. Now we have come to the morning watch. Twilight has not yet broken the velvet blackness of the sky as our souls follow the cautious figure of a group of women moving toward the garden. It is night and we have slept in the image of death as our Savior's body has slept in the tomb. As we spiritually move toward the tomb in the pre-dawn darkness, the lights of the church are off. Only a candle burns in the center and a few on the sides as the reader begins to intone the six psalms with compunction. As we come half of the way, halfway to the tomb, halfway through the six songs, the priest comes out of the sanctuary bareheaded and stands before the closed royal doors as if standing before the closed tomb of Christ. Saying these prayers, the tomb is still closed. Christ rose leaving the tomb sealed. The hymns of the church tell us that he rose whilst the tomb was still sealed and closed. As we approach, the angels suddenly cast away the stone in a burst of light, and the soldiers fall to the ground in shock. The tomb has been opened so that we may perceive the awesome mystery. The six songs lead us step by step to the tomb, our souls trembling in the face of death, hoping in the promise, and finally rejoicing in the discovery. O oh Lord, why are those who afflict me increase? Many rise up against me, many say to my soul, there is no salvation for him and his God. O oh Lord, do not rebuke me in anger, nor chasten me in wrath. O oh God, my God, arise early at dawn, my soul has thirsted for thee. O oh Lord God, my salvation by day and by night I have cried before thee. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. O oh Lord, hear my prayer and give ear to my supplication. We will come to the tomb, and like the myrrh-bearing women, will find it opened. The priest, like the angel in the garden, will proclaim, In peace let us pray to the Lord. 
And then God is the Lord and has appeared unto us. Blessed is he who cometh in the name of the Lord. This is the stone which the builders rejected. It has become the head cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. Matins is the end of the night watch, the waking from sleep. As sleep is a type of death, so waking is a type of resurrection. As St. Ephraim the Syrian says, How like is death to sleep and resurrection to the morning? Matins is a resurrection service. In the Sunday Matins we read the resurrection gospel, and here the end of the near the end of the service we chant the great doxology, Glory to thee who has shown us the light. In old times that would be uh, chanted, just at sunrise. And I remember reading how sometimes in Russia at the monasteries on feast days, the faithful would gather so many that they couldn't fit inside the monastery so that parts of the service would actually be served on the wall of the monastery because thousands of people would be gathered in the fields round about. On one occasion they numbered about 15,000. And they would chant the Vespers together. And then all night long, read from the Psalter, read the Psalms, keep the Compton in the midnight hour, continue to read the Psalms, and they would start the service so that just as sun would rise over the horizon, the priest would cry out, Glory to thee who has shown us the light, or the deacon. And everyone would break into singing the great doxology, Glory to God in the highest. And it would have been such a marvelous experience to see and to hear. And now so few people in the church actually sing. We have the choir, sort of like janitaries or janissaries, uh, doing our battle for us instead of participating fully in the divine services. Matins is the end of night, the night watch, the waking from sleep. And at just sunrise, the priest cries, Glory to thee who has shown the light. Having come to the tomb and beheld the resurrection of Christ proclaimed in the gospel reading, we chant, Let us who have beheld the resurrection of Christ worship our holy Lord Jesus, the only sinless one. We venerate thy cross, O Christ, and we hymn and glorify thy holy resurrection. Matthew celebrates the victory of Christ over death and sends a song toward the feast of the divine liturgy with joy so that there we may receive the fruits of that victory, that we may participate fully in the risen Christ and the newness of life that he has bestowed upon us. This is important to remember, brothers and sisters, that in Vespers we stand before the closed gates of paradise. And the priest is a type of all humanity standing with bared head, reading the prayers during the chanting of the creation psalm. Then we come to Matins. And in the beginning of Matins, as we read the six psalms, nobody in the church moves at all. The candles are put out, one or two lights, the candle light or a light that the reader can see in order to read the six psalms. And think about it. Someone asked me, is it really necessary to put out the candles and not to move about in the church? Why is this? Some people want to change it, you see. Because we're in the still darkness of the pre-dawn. Because we're coming to the time when the light barely breaks the horizon. The day has fully come, of course, because it's past midnight. And the myrrh-bearing women going in that semi-light come to find the tomb, expecting to find it sealed, the door closed and the seals upon it and the guards guarding it, hoping that somehow the stone can be rolled away so that they can enter and finish the anointing of the body. We are in that precise time period during the reading of the six psalms. It is still just pre-dawn. It is still just before the sun has risen. 
It is still in that chill, sometimes damp with dew yet, early morning. And we become the burbearing women approaching the tomb. But we come and we stand in awe and the lights are out because of the time of day that it is. So that we can, in, in, a, in a mystery, or mystically as well, physically, feel and sense the moment so that we can be present to the moment. We can be present to that pre-dawn time and see the sun just barely rising over the horizon and hear the roosters crowing in the distance. And the women perhaps trembling a little inside, but taking courage from the very love that burns in their hearts for, for our Lord Jesus Christ. And we stand in awe and wait as the service unfolds before us. Brothers and sisters, how much more meaningful if instead of wondering how we can truncate matins, how we can shorten it, how we can change it, how we can somehow modernize it, you know, turn on all the electric lights at the beginning and uh, go ahead and move around light candles and things during the reading of the six psalms. What would matins mean then? But think about what it actually means and how much more profound and deeply it would move our souls and our spirits if we, rather than thinking how to change it, actually entered in to the mystery and the meaning of the Matin service. This is one of our great shortcomings in our day in our approach to the divine services is that we don't contemplate the meaning, we don't really enter into the meaning. We pass from Matins into the liturgy, crossing over the bridge of the first hour. We pass from the discovery of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ to glorify the one who has truly shown us the light. And then we pass into the eschatological service which the divine liturgy is eschatology. We often use the word apocalypse, but that of course is a misuse because apocalypse simply means prophecy or revelation. It doesn't mean the end times or the end of the world. Eschatology, meaning our understanding of the final things and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember that in so many, among so many Christians and others, the contemplation of the end of the the age, the second coming, so often thought of with a sense of terror, with a sense of foreboding, with a sense of catastrophe and tragedy. And this is one of the very reasons why some Protestants cooked up the new doctrine of, of, of rapture, because they looked toward the eschaton, the, eschaton, the, the last termination of all the ages and the coming of the age of, of the heavenly kingdom. They looked upon it with such dread and fear and terror that they had to somehow concoct in their minds a way that they could escape from any kind of suffering. Unlike the first century martyrs who rejoiced in their suffering. They rejoiced in their suffering because they knew it was a proclamation of the gospel. They rejoiced in the face of death because they knew that Jesus Christ had ransomed us from the grave, had ransomed us from the fear of death. And that to be in fear of death was to be in the hands of Satan. But to acknowledge that our Lord Jesus Christ has conquered the power of death and vouchsafed to us everlasting life. This is the great confession of the faith. It's easy to confess a book. And many religious people worship a book whether it's the, what we call the Bible, whether it's the Hebrew Bible, or whether it's the Quran. People are in bondage to a book, and they cannot see beyond it to the living word. Our Lord Jesus Christ becomes only a word for them. 
But so many ancient Christians and so many martyrs under the Ottoman yoke, the Turkish yoke, so many martyrs under communism rejoiced that they had been blessed to be holy martyrs and rejoiced in their suffering because it was a proclamation of the truth of the gospel and looked in the face of death and said, my Lord Jesus Christ has conquered you for me. I don't fear you because I know the victory of my Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ is my victory and I have that victory in him. Do what you will, my Lord Jesus Christ stands waiting for me on the other side. These were the way people approached. Let's look at the Divine Liturgy. This is an eschatological service. It takes us to the end times, if you will. I think that the only way you can possibly understand the book of Revelation is through the Divine Liturgy. Because all of those major elements of the symbolism, and he says, I was in the spirit of the Lord's day. And then he sees the doors opening in the heavens as the royal gates open at the beginning of the liturgy. And you see into paradise. And you see on the altar would have been the Torah that was being referred to in the book of Revelation because there was no gospel book. But you notice that in the liturgy, the four gospels are on the holy table. Not the whole Bible, the four gospels. The Christian Torah has replaced the Old Testament Torah on the holy table. And in this one we see Christ robed in the description of the robing and the vesting, somewhat like the way the, the outer vestment of the Torah. The, the way the outer vestment of the gospel book that we have on the altar semi-precious stones and gold. So when we first look into the paradise, we see the throne, that is the holy table, and there we see Christ represented by the gospel. After the great entrance, when the priest brings back the, the holy gifts into the holy place, into the altar, and places them on the throne of Christ, when the gifts are uncovered, what do we see? One like a lamb that was slain. The, the bread of life on the discos, cut crosswise. One like a lamb that was slain. That's how we see Jesus Christ now. All of these elements of the book of Revelation are there. But we understand that the divine liturgy is a wedding banquet. It's the wedding banquet between the heavenly bridegroom and the earthly bride the church, in which we all partake of this great and mystical feast, the bread of life, which has been placed before us in Christ Jesus. And we see the chalice there. We will receive communion from the chalice. The chalice is the tree of life that grows in the midst of paradise. And the fruit of the tree of life is our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ. And we'll partake of Him. We'll partake of the fruit of the tree of life in the divine liturgy. The gates of paradise have been opened once more. The tree of life grows and bears fruit abundantly before us. And we receive of that tree in Holy Communion. The Divine Liturgy takes us into that eternal day, the eternal wedding banquet. And it really is about the last great struggle between light and darkness, between good and evil. This is played out in the Divine Liturgy itself. And if you look at the iconostas, notice on the one side the icon of the first coming of Jesus Christ. Christ in the arms of the Virgin. The first coming of Jesus Christ. On the other side, the icon of Christ himself. The second coming of Jesus Christ. And between the first and the second coming of Jesus Christ, the gospel is proclaimed to the world, both through the reading of the gospel and through the preaching of the sermon, and through all those things that are done in the divine liturgy. It's important to note that no other part of the divine scripture is kept on the altar except the four gospels, the type of Jesus Christ himself. 
We call it the Word of God sometimes, but really we should say it's the Word about the Word of God. It's the Word about God the Word. It is a type of Jesus Christ on the altar. The epistles of the uh, apostles are out on the reader's stand. Where they'll be read from, by the reader from the middle of the church. The book of Revelation is not in the church at all. The book of Revelation is never found inside the Orthodox Church. There's a reason for that, and we'll discuss that reason a little bit later. But you see how much mischief attempts to interpret the book of Revelation have caused over the centuries. But that time is played out in the Divine Liturgy itself. So much of the symbolism in the Divine Liturgy is really exploring the meaning of all of the eschatological statements from the scripture, or as most of you would be used to hearing apocalyptic statements, from the divine scripture itself. The divine liturgy really takes us into paradise again to share in the tree of life and brings us to look into the heavenly kingdom itself and see the throne of the living God and see that the Ark of the Covenant, the Old Covenant, is gone because the Most Holy Theotokos is the Ark of the New Covenant. She bore in her womb all those things which were symbolically present in the Ark of the Covenant. The rod that bore, budded like a living tree and our Lord Jesus Christ is a rod out of the root of Jesse, budding like a living tree. The law but in the womb of the virgin, the giver of the law, come to fulfill the law and come to deliver us from bondage to the law. The pot of manna, the heavenly bread which came down from heaven. And in the womb of the virgin, the living bread which came down from God to feed and to nourish us with our daily bread. The virgin herself is the ark of the new covenant. And all these things are made manifest in the divine liturgy which takes us toward the glorious culmination. Not with fear and trembling do Orthodox Christians look toward the end, but rather with joy and expectation, because the second coming of Jesus Christ is the glorious culmination of all the prophecies and all the promises that have given us the strength and the courage to endure. It's not a moment of terror for us, who believe and have faith. For in an instant, our conscience takes us to the right or to the left. And it doesn't take us to the right or to the left whether we've been perfect or imperfect, but whether we've had faith not only in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ, but in the inner content of his person, of his teaching, of the gospel which he preached. We try, we fail. Because we try, our Lord Jesus Christ makes up the difference for us. The cross of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, these things are more powerful than the entire universe combined. There is nothing for which the cross of Christ is insufficient. There is no insufficiency in our redemption through our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ. We can look for the second coming of Christ while struggling against our passions, struggling to be what we ought to be, knowing that our Lord Jesus Christ is the bridge who will make up the difference for us because we believe and because we put forth the be the struggle, the effort to try. Not that we accomplish, but we try. This is uh, the promise of the Divine Liturgy, and Matins brings us to the point of that, because the resurrection of Jesus Christ is a new beginning for the universe. The incarnation of God and the resurrection of Jesus Christ are so closely related and so much a part of our salvation. The cross would have meant nothing without the incarnation of the living God and the life of Christ on earth 
and the teaching of Christ. And then entering again into a cave of the earth as he did when he was born, he comes forth in the glorious resurrection. And the one who came down from heaven ascends back to heaven and blazes a trail for us to follow him into the heavenly kingdom through the grace and power of the Holy Spirit. Brothers and sisters, let us rejoice in our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ. And we'll continue, we'll talk a little bit about the sequence plan of the liturgy and uh, the Paschal cycle as well. Uh, because the cycles are so beautifully laid out in the church and they lead us on such a wondrous path. So I think we'll just continue briefly through those things. Remember, this book that is available free, completely free of charge, just mention or give me your mailing address either in the comments on this video on YouTube or uh, email us at uh, synaxis at orthodox canada. We'll be happy to send you a hundred copies if you wish uh, of this booklet on the uh, spiritual and scriptural meaning of the cycle of orthodox Christian divine services. I think it's worth reading and I think people should read it. The more we know about the worship services, the more deeply we enter full of understanding from our hearts into the divine services, and the more they enrich us and lead us into the joy and expectation of everlasting life. Thank you all for joining us. We still ask for your prayers, and God bless you all.